Glamour Prestige presents Virtual Learning Party every Tuesday and Thursday starting March 24th, 2020 for students in grades 3 through 6, reading and English only. Your hosts are Dr. Jacqueline Walker and Velvet Smith, who are ready to turn up for learning. Hey! hey. So today's SOLs are 3.4. The student will expand vocabulary when reading. F, use vocabulary for other content areas. And the same is for fourth grade, but it's 4.4. D, use vocabulary from other content areas. All right, for fifth grade, the SOL is 5.4. The student will read, will expand vocabulary when reading. E, use word reference materials. And for sixth grade, it's 6.4. The student will read and determine the meanings of unfamiliar words and phrases within authentic text. And that's E, use word reference materials. And the I can for today is I can use vocabulary for other content areas with 100% accuracy with the help of word reference materials, mentor text, videos, and graphic organizers. Hi, guys. We're back. We didn't get to see you since last Thursday, so that's been a couple of days. But today is Tuesday, May the 19th, and we are ready for your next lesson. So on today, we're going to talk about content area vocabulary so we're going to talk about words that are in non-fiction books like social studies or science books and resources to help us use those all right let's get ready to learn welcome to kids academy Hi, boys and girls. Do you know what it means to vote? When people vote, they make an important choice. What if your family couldn't decide what to eat for dinner? What could you do? Take a vote to choose a dish. What if your basketball team needs a new captain? What could you do? Take a vote. As a citizen, voting is very important. Grown-ups who are 18 and older vote when it is time to choose new leaders for a community. This could be the mayor of a city or the governor of a state. Citizens even vote for the president of the United States. Let's see what happens when people vote. On election day, Citizens go to a special place, like a library, or a school gym, to vote for leaders in their community. Inside, there are many voting booths. These booths help people keep their votes private. Voters select their choices on a ballot and put it in the ballot box. Some voting booths have special computers instead of ballot boxes. After all the votes have been counted, a new leader is chosen. Let's review. When people vote, they make important choices. Citizens vote for leaders such as mayors, governors, and presidents. Election day is a special day for voting. Voters select their choices on a ballot and place it in a ballot box. The votes are counted and a new leader is chosen. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Subscribe to our channel to stay updated on new videos. Find links to our apps in the comments below. All right, so since our strand for the week is talking about content area vocabulary, we want to look at vocabulary strategies and how that can help us to better understand content vocabulary. So for number one, you can reread or read on and look for clues in the text. Number two, check a picture or visualize the sentence. Number three, use a known part. 
courageous. You could look at courage, preventative. You could look at prevent. Number four, make a connection to other words you know, such as introductory or introduce. And you can use the glossary or also the dictionary or other text features. Okay, now we're going to look at let's learn how to use a dictionary. And like we said before, content area vocabulary is normally in a glossary, but we know a glossary is just a mini dictionary. So the dictionary is a reference book that gives us information about words. Look at this brief overview of a dictionary page. So you have guide words. Guide words tell you the first and last entry words that appear on the page. If you look at the guide words there, it has baby and bed. Then we have the entry word. Words are listed in A, B, C or alphabetical order. So the entry word is the first word. Then we have the part of speech. It tells the part of speech for the entry word. This can change with the new meaning. So as you see, this one is pointing to a jet adjective, but if you look on baby, it's a noun, and if you look on bed, it's a noun, but ball is an adjective. All right, and then we have the definition. It's the meaning of a word. Many words have more than one definition and meaning. So then we find out what the word actually means. All right, so we're going to get some practice. We are going to look at some text evidence that is going to be informational. And you know, you just saw the video not too long ago about voting. And then when we get into your mentor text, you're going to see how this all ties in together. So this passage is called Every Four Years. Every four years, we elect the president of the United States. Here's how the process unfolds. First, about 18 months before Election Day, Democratic and Republican candidates announce their plans to run for president. In the following months, they give speeches and hold debates. They try to win supporters. Then, beginning in February of the election year, states across the country hold their primaries. Primaries are elections to choose one Democratic and one Republican candidate. They are a bit like the playoffs in sports. Once these candidates are chosen, they campaign until November. Finally, in November, Americans vote to decide who will be the next president. So as you can see, our bolded word is campaign. And that is a content area vocabulary word that we would find in social studies or history. All right, so now we want to know what does it mean? And like we said before, campaign is our content area vocabulary. So if you have this sheet, please take this sheet out. If you don't, you can always use a plain sheet of notebook paper. So here we have a graphic organizer and it's going to help us decide what is the meaning of campaign as our content area vocabulary. So we have definition, we have part of speech, is it a noun, verb, adjective, or adverb? We're going to have synonyms, we're going to have antonyms, and then we have the sentence. So what we're going to do is using the passage that we just had, we're going to figure out what is the definition of campaign and then put in synonyms, antonyms, and use it in a sentence. So you also have the ability to use the dictionary. And if you want to use one online, I've added one in there for you. It's called kids.wordsmith.net. And it should be at the end of your sheet. But if you don't see it, it's K-I-D-S dot word w o r d smith s m y t h dot net because remember we also have to use our word reference materials such as a dictionary or a glossary to find out this information so you can pause us right now and use your word reference material the dictionary or refer back to the passage to fill in this graphic organizer on our content area word campaign all right, we're going to reveal the answers. Let's go. 
All right, so our content area ver word campaign and it, the definitions are verb to take an active part in a campaign, noun, a series of planned actions carried out in order to reach a particular goal. The part of speech has two for this particular word campaign. It can be a noun or it can also be a verb. All right, so synonyms or words that are similar for the noun is crusade or drive, and for the verb is run. And we didn't have any antonyms that went exactly with the word campaign. And then we have two sentences. So for the noun part of speech, an example of one sentence would be, we are helping with the, with the campaign for her election as governor. And for the verb, we have Bill Clinton campaign for president in 1996. So just remember, these are two examples of sentences for the noun and verb for campaign. You could have any other type of sentence that you want. Hi, guys. We are back. It is now time for your mentor text. And of course, we always introduce the mentor text to you before you actually get to either see it or hear it or read it. But this week, once again, we have a mentor text that you actually have that your parents picked up or was mailed to you. So you have this book right here. It is called If the, if the Walls Could Talk, Family Life at the White House. And it was written by Jane O'Connor and it illustrated illustrations were by Gary Hogland. Okay, Ms. Smith is going to read you just a little bit about it on the inside. All right, so it says, what is life really like in the White House? I wonder. Me too. In case you've ever wondered, the walls at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue have eyes and ears, and what's more, they don't miss a thing. Now listen up because the walls have a thing or two to tell you. Hear these funny, surprising stories and more about the most famous home in America and the extraordinary families who have lived in it. Hmm, very intriguing. All right, if the walls could talk. Here it goes. If the walls could talk, Family Life at the White House by Jane O'Connor, illustrated by Gary Hovland. All right, let's look at this Sunday edition of the Metro Area Newspaper. Homes, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, beautiful 200-year-old mansion on 18 acres of land right in the heart of downtown Washington, D.C. 132 rooms with 147 windows and 28 fireplaces, including three kitchens, a dining room that seats more than 100 people, 32 bathrooms, three elevators, a tennis court, movie theater, bowling alley, outdoor swimming pool, basketball court, putting green, and separate and separate office wings. This dream home house comes completely furnished with priceless antiques and paintings, as well as a staff of 100 people and can be yours absolutely free if you become the President of the United States. If you would like to know more about this special property, go to www.whitehouse.gov. Okay, so right here we have a picture of the White House. So we're going to start on the left hand side. It has private family rooms. Then it goes down to the second floor. It has state dining room. Then down to the first floor, it has red room. Then down to the ground floor, it has the diplomatic reception room. If we look in the middle, on the ground floor, it has a china room. On the first floor, it has a blue room and a green room. On the right side, on the first floor, it has the library and the east room. And on the right side, on the second floor, it has Lincoln bedroom and Queen's bedroom. If the walls could talk, family life at the White House. 1789 through 1797. For the president's house, I would design a building which should look forward. George Washington. I'm the only president who never lived in the White House. It was George Washington who chose the design of the White House. 
He also chose the location of the capital, the heart of the new nation and home of the new Congress. He wanted the capital to be near Mount Vernon, his home in Virginia, and so it was. He was embarrassed that it was named Washington. He preferred Federal City. Although it wasn't much of a city yet, there were only 3,000 people, two unpaved streets, and no trees, and most of the houses were little more than wooden shacks. Washington expected the president's house to grow bigger over time, and it has. Construction began in 1792 with African Americans, slaves as well as free men, providing most of the labor, because often there wasn't enough money for supplies or workmen. The house was still not finished when George Washington died in 1799. However, he did not live to see the building begin to rise, and the outside looks very much the same today as it did in Washington's time. 1797 to 1801. May none but honest and wise men rule under this roof, John Adams. I used to hang laundry in the East Room to dry. The walls were not even plastered yet. The first tenants, John Adams and his wife, Abigail, moved into the house in 1800. The roof leaked, most windows had no glass, and planks led to the front door. Piles of stone and wood lay stacked in the backyard. There was also an outhouse that could accommodate three people. The Adams lived in the White House for only four months before Thomas Jefferson became the next president. 1801 to 1809. It's big enough for two emperors, one pope, and the Grand Lama, attributed to Thomas Jefferson. I'm Tom's pet, Mockingbird. I'm his grandson, James, the first baby born in the White House. People were shocked when I'd come to the door in my bathrobe and slippers. Thomas Jefferson never liked the White House very much, perhaps in part because his own design for the mansion, submitted under fake initials, hadn't, pick, hadn't been picked. While he was president, Jefferson added a long terrace with beautiful columns on either side of the house. His wife had died long before he was elected president, so his daughter and their families often came for long visits. 1809 through 1825. Well, just when the White House was finished and looking beautiful, it burned down. During the War of 1812, when James Madison was president, British troops stormed into Washington. On August 23, 1814, soldiers set fire to the White House, although not until they had finished eating the food that Dolly Madison had set out for dinner. They also changed into clean underwear that they had found. Poor me, James was with the troops. I saved the portrait of George Washington, historic papers, and my parrot. I have I have had the wagon filled where I shall go tomorrow, I cannot tell, Dolly Madison. After the fire, only the black and outer walls of the house remained. The Madisons never lived in the White House again. It took two years to rebuild the mansion. In the fall of 1817, James Monroe, now president, was able to move back in. Even though not all of the work was finished, he and his wife Elizabeth bought beautiful furniture from France. Some of it is still in the blue room. Our daughter Maria was the first child of a president to be married in the White House. 1825 to 1837. I love to garden. I planted many trees on the South Lawn. In the 1800, presidents were guarded the way they are today, and the grounds of the White House were open to the public. During John Quincy Adams' presidency, people might have caught a glimpse of the president, a son of John Adams, while he was gardening. Andrew Jackson believed that anybody should be able to walk into the White House and meet the president. At the open house celebration on the night Jackson took office, 20,000 people showed up. Just too many. They trapped in mud, ruined rugs, broke furniture, and cut bits of curtains for souvenirs and smashed china. I am counting the days of my captivity here, Andrew Jackson. I ducked out and spent the night at a hotel. 1837 through 1857. 
So far, 41 presidents have lived in the White House. Some didn't live there long. Some were glad to leave. Some are names rarely mentioned except in the history books. But every president and his family have left their mark on the White House. Out it goes. I had the shortest term of any president. I had 15 children more than any other president. Martin Van Buren auctioned off furniture that he thought was ugly. This was often the fate of unwanted White House furnishings. Old China was sometimes just thrown into the Potomac River. William Henry Harrison hardly had time to unpack. He died from pneumonia 30 days after becoming president. His wife was still at home in Ohio. She never got to live in the White House. When John Tyler was president, newspapers called the White House the public shabby house, but Congress wouldn't provide any money to fix it up. During James Polk's presidency, gas lamps replaced candles and oil lamps in the White House. He was the first president to have his picture taken in the White House. Franklin Pierce came to the White House in the morning over the recent death of his third and only surviving son, Benny. His wife, Jane, had black bunting draped in the staterooms. Zachary Taylor let his favorite horse, Old Whitey, graze on the White House lawn. People would pluck hairs from the horse's tail for souvenirs. Millard Fillmore wanted to modernize the White House. He had a bigger furnace installed and a gas stove put in the kitchen, but nobody knew how to use it. That is not my house. It's the people's house, Franklin Pierce. Stop that. My wife, Abigail, started the first library in the White House. 1857 to 1865. If you as happy, my dear sir, on entering the house as I am leaving it and going home, then you are the happiest man on earth, James Buchanan. I love flowers and built a greenhouse at the White House. It's no wonder James Buchanan was the happy when his presidency was over. The country was heading towards the Civil War. Buchanan is the only president who never married. People sent all sorts of pets to the White House to keep him company. After war broke out, sometimes Union troops camped out in the East Room. Abraham Lincoln scolded his wife Mary for buying more and more expensive furniture when soldiers on the battlefield went without blankets. It's a diversion, and we need a diversion at the White House, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln's words explain why he enjoyed the pranks of his spirited, some, some say it spoiled, younger sons, Tad and Willie. Lincoln bought them two pet goats that were allowed upstairs in the bedrooms. He loved reading to the boys and roughhousing with them. It must have helped Lincoln to forget the problems facing him as the president. 1865 through 1881. At Abraham Lincoln's funeral, souvenir hunters cut off pieces of the curtains, stole silverware, and spit tobacco juice on the rugs. The White House was in disrepair, and there were rats all over the place. The White House was the largest and best playground available. Jesse Grant, Ulysses S. Grant's son. I was once a tailor. I like to make quilts. I mended curtains myself. Andrew Johnson had the house clean and wanted to fix up the place, but Congress wouldn't give him the money to do so. Rather than remove the rats, Congress tried to remove Johnson from office. He remained, though, and so did the rats. General Ulysses S. Grant and his family enjoyed life in the White House. He and his youngest son, Jesse, liked to stargaze on the roof. His wife, Julia, redecorated in the fancy style of that time. James Garfield was president for only four months before he was shot at a train station. He died several months later. I had an air cooling device put in my room. Our phone number was one. Rutherford B. Hayes and his wife Lucy began the tradition of the Easter egg rolls on the South Lawn. 1881 to 1885. I would not live in a house like this, Chester Arthur. I love to dress well. I had 80 pairs of pants. Chester Arthur never cared for the White House. He wanted it torn down and a new house built from scratch. Here's what Congress said. No. So instead, Arthur had 24 wagon loads of stuff carted off and sold. Then he hired the famous designer, Louis C. Tiffany, to re redecorate the house from top to bottom. Chester Arthur liked to give big parties. One was for 5,000 people. 
1885 to 1889. Sometimes I wake at night in the White House and rub my eyes and wonder if it's not all a dream. Glover Cleveland. I call her prank. I call him Uncle Cleve because he was so much older than me. And he's 49, you know, and she's only 21. Grover Cleveland was married in the blue room at the White House. When he lost the next election, his beautiful and popular wife, Frances, told the staff that they'd be back in four years. And she was right. Cleveland is the only president whose second term didn't come right after his first. 1889 through 1901. I had electric lights installed, but we didn't like to test the switches because of shocks. By the end of the 1800s, the White House was starting to burst at the seams. The president's staff, which kept growing larger, still worked in offices on the second floor. The president's family didn't have enough room or privacy. Benjamin Harrison, grandson of William Henry Harrison, and his wife Caroline came with their daughters and grandchildren. The Harrisons put up the first Christmas tree inside the White House. Now, each year, the ornaments have a theme such as state flowers, mother goose characters, or birds of America. After William McKinley, who was kind-hearted, cheerful, and one of the most popular presidents ever, was shot and killed, the Secret Service assigned agents to protect the president and his family. My wife Ida didn't like the color yellow. She banned it from the White House. During Grover Cleveland's second term, the Cleveland's daughter Esther was born in the White House. So far, she's the only child of a president who was born there. 1901 to 1909. I don't think any family has enjoyed the White House more than we have, Theodore Roosevelt. I made White House the official name of the mansion. Vice President Teddy Roosevelt became president after William McKinley died. He was only 42 years old and right away he loved being president. What energy he had. After a new tennis court was installed, the president is said to have played 91 games in one day. The six rambunctious Roosevelt kids like to slide down the stairs on cookie trays, walk on stilts through the hallways, roller skate in the East Room, and shimmy up the flagpole. The White House was now 100 years old. Edith, Teddy Roosevelt's calm, dependable wife, oversaw a major renovation. There wasn't enough office space, so the greenhouses were torn down and a new wing was built, the West Wing, where the president's over office is located. 1909 through 1913. I'm glad to be going. This is the lonesomest place on earth, William Howard Taft. I was the first president with a car. I turned the stables into a garage. Unlike Roosevelt, William Taft didn't enjoy being president, but at least he could relax in a hot bath after a special tub was made for him. Taft was a big guy, six feet, two inches tall and more than 300 pounds. His tub could fit four ordinary sized men. Suddenly, we became goldfish in a bowl. Eleanor William McAdoo, William Woodrow Wilson's daughter. I think you missed the spot. 1913 through 1921. During the 19th century, the White House vegetable gardens, as well as cows and pigs kept on the grounds, provided food for the first families. By Woodrow Wilson's time, however, food was brought at grocery stores and butcher shops. So why did the Wilsons keep sheep on the line? In 1917, so many men were needed as soldiers to fight in the World War I that the Wilsons didn't think it was right to have gardeners. Instead, sheep trimmed the White House grass, knitted socks for soldiers, from their wool. 1921 to 1923. Let them look in if they want to. It's their house, Florence Harding. During one of his many poker games, Warren Harding gambled away a whole set of White House china. There were many scandals while Harding was president. He liked playing golf more than working his job. Laddie Boy, Hardest beloved Airedale, and his own servant at the White House, and his own chair at cabinet meetings. 1923 to 1933. It's a home rich in tradition, mellow with years, hallowed with memories. Grace Coolidge. You were called Silent Cow, is it that right, dear? For a last minute guess, we had the cook made White House surprise supreme, a fancy term for leftovers. It was as bleak as a New England barn, Lou Hoover. K 
Calvin Coolidge hardly ever cracked a smile. His warm and vibrant wife, Grace, was a popular first lady, though. The Coolidges had a new roof put on and it converted the attic into a floor of bedrooms and offices. Herbert Hoover was a self-made millionaire and he didn't like dealing with servants. He never looked at or spoke to them. Servants at the White House had to duck into closets if President Hoover came down a hall. 1933 to 1945. I never forget that I live in a house owned by all the American people and that I have been given their trust, Franklin D. Roosevelt. I was elected four times. I loved the job. The Roosevelt's lived in the White House for 12 years longer than any other family. Because of polio, Franklin D. Roosevelt, or FDR as he was called, was confined to a wheelchair. School children across the country raised money to build an indoor pool at the White House so that he could exercise. A house that is on exhibition should look its best at all times, Eleanor Roosevelt. I was the first lady, the first first lady to hold a press conference. New Deal facts and figures. It was difficult for FDR to travel, so his wife Eleanor became his eyes and ears. She was away so much that a newspaper ran a fake headline, Mrs. Roosevelt spends night in White House. Eleanor was different from first ladies before her. She had a career, many in fact. She taught school, wrote a daily newspaper column, and a best-selling book, and always told the president exactly what she thought he should do. She was too busy to spend much time furnishing and redecorating the White House, but in 1942, the East Wing was expanded. It houses a movie theater and offices. 1945 to 1953. It's a glamorous prison, Harry S. Truman. After one of the legs of his daughter's piano broke through the second floor, Harry S. Truman and the White House expected Good thing he did. A building engineer told him that the house was standing up purely from habit. In 1948, President Truman, his wife Bess, and their daughter Margaret moved out the White House while the inside of the house was gutted and rebuilt. We moved back four years later. 1953 to 1961. I like the place and all it stood for. It conveyed to us the simple greatness of America, Dwight Eisenhower. Nothing like a good Western. Shh. I love Lucy is on. World War II General Dwight Eisenhower and his wife Mamie moved into a new and improved White House. Ike and Mamie often ate dinner on trays while they watched television. They had his and her sets because they liked different shows. 1961 through 1963. I think a couple of spies are here. The White House dramatizes the greatest story of the U.S., John F. Kennedy. Not since Teddy Roosevelt had there been a family with young children living in the White House. And what a family. President John F. Kennedy and his wife Jacqueline seemed like glamorous movie stars. The nation loved watching the antics of their daughter Caroline and her little brother John John. The Kennedys took great pride in the White House. If the lawn looked dry when important guests were coming, Kennedy would have it spray painted green. I want to make this a good house, a place where visitors learn about history, Jacqueline Kennedy. People call this the Queen's bedroom because seven queens have slept in it. Jacqueline Kennedy is remembered for turning the White House into a place of culture and beauty, restoring rooms with furniture and belongings of past first families. In 1962, Jackie gave a television tour of the White House. 42 million people watched. Now the White House is the number one tourist attraction in Washington, D.C. 1963 to 1969. Only af hours after John F. Kennedy was shot and killed in Dallas, Texas, Lyndon Johnson was sworn into office. For Johnson, the unpopular war in Vietnam hung over his years in the White House like a dark cloud. Anti-war pro protesters would often demonstrate across the street. There's a wall around me that no one gets through. When I walked through the rooms of the White House, I had a constant sense of a host of companions. I knew that I had walked with history. Lady Bird Johnson. 1969 to 1974. Picture a giant fishbowl with spotlights. Julie Nixon Eisenhower, Richard Nixon's daughter. Maybe putting in the press room wasn't such a good idea. Did you know about the Watergate break-in? Because of political scandals, Richard Nixon is the only president to resign and move out of the White House before his term was over. 
While he lived there, he put in a one-lane bowling alley and covered up FDR's indoor, indoor swimming pool to make a press room for reporters. 1974 through present. Now more than 200 years old, the White House is where the past lives and where history is made every day. It is where the president works. It is also a museum. But each day after the public leaves, the velvet ropes are taken away and the rugs are rolled out. It becomes a home again, a home that changes with every family lucky enough to live there. Gerald Ford had an outdoor pool built so he could stay in shape. The fort's youngest child, Susan, had her senior prom at the White House. Jimmy Carter, youngest daughter, Amy, had a treehouse where she could find peace and privacy. At times, Carter probably wanted to join her there to escape from economic and foreign problems that troubled his presidency. Ronald Reagan, who was nearly 70 when he took office, was the oldest president ever and an actor in Hollywood before he entered politics. He met his future wife, Nancy, on a movie set. They liked to give lavish parties at the White House. George Bush came from a rich and powerful New England family. His wife, Barbara, wrote a best-selling book about their dog, Millie's life at the White House. Despite personal scandals and an impeachment trial, Bill Clinton was a popular president. He liked to jaw and had a running track set up on the White House grounds. George W. Bush was the son of George Bush. He and his wife, Laura, had two teenage daughters, Jenna and Barbara, the first White House twins. We honor all the presidents who came before us and all who will come after. When John Adams moved into the White House, his wife, Abigail, was still in Philadelphia. He wrote her a letter, part of which has become known as the White House Blessing. It is carved into the mantle in the state dining room, pictured on the preceding page. These, were, these are the words. I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings on this house and all that shall hereafter inhabit it. May none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof. Honey, I'm home. All right. If the walls could talk, family life at the White House. Did you enjoy all of those tidbits about our former presidents and what was going on in the White House? I read a lot. It was very interesting. How about you, Dr. Walker? Yes, some of those stories that they told, of course, I didn't know, but I didn't even know some of that stuff actually happened because I've never heard it before. So I think that the walls were really talking to give us all the information about what went down at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Now we have to review our vocabulary strategy, of course, like we always do. So like we stated before, when we first started out with guided practice, that in order to understand content area vocabulary, you understand the strategy. So wondering what a word means. So the first strategy that we have that's connected to it is to use your prior knowledge. So as you see, it's a smiley face with a thinking bubble that says, I know. So that basically means to, when you come across a word and you already know it, you're just using the prior knowledge of things or information that you've known before. Next is read around the word. So we have word in the middle and we have arrows going around it. That means read the sentences that come before and after the word to give an understanding of what does that word actually mean. Then we have look at text features. We have maps, captions, bold words. And as you know, from just reading your book of the week, it had lots of text features. Next, think about word parts. Prefixes are beginning word parts such as un, dis, and re. So we have un, which means not, and then we have usual, and together that makes unusual or not usual. Then we have suffixes, ending word parts such as able, fool, ly. So then we have delight, which means happy, and then we have full, which means full of. So then together it is delightful or full of delight or being happy. And then we have to choose a substitute. As you can see, it says what makes sense. So if you look back at the think about word parts, the text features, the read around the word and the use your prior knowledge, if you use all of those strategies, you make it come up with a substitute word for a word that you may not understand. But using all of those strategies, you can choose that one so that you have a better understanding of it.
All right. And then lastly is it an M and M word and not M and M the candy, but multiple meaning word. So for example, we have bat. So is it the bat, the flying animal, or is it bat like in a baseball bat? Which one? So we have to determine that by using all of our strategies. All right, guys, you know what time it is. It's time for our TikTok. All right, guys, now it's time for you to take out your independent activity sheet. And if you don't have a sheet like this, of course, you know that you can always use a sheet of notebook paper. And at the top, you're going to write vocabulary word, definition, sentence, and notes. And how this sheet is going to work is that you're going to use an online dictionary or you have a dictionary in your house to define the word. You're going to find the sentence in your mentor text of the week since you do have that book with you. And of course, if you don't have the book with you, you can always go back and look at the mentor text video. And then lastly, make a note to yourself that can help you to remember that particular word. All right, Ms. Smith is going to let you know all the vocabulary words. All right, so our six content area vocabulary words for today is one, president, two, Congress, three, White House, four, presidency, five, history, six, country. Remember, we're going to be writing the definition, the sentence from the mentor text, and then notes that helped us with the definition and sentence. So go ahead and pause us, and then when we come back, we will go over the answers with you. Are you ready? All right. Let's look at the answers. All right. So let's look at what we have for our first content area vocabulary word, president. Definition, an officer elected to lead a group or organization. Sentence from the mentor text, President John Kennedy and his wife, Jacqueline, seem like glamorous movie stars. A note, the U.S. has had 45 presidents. Congress, the branch of a national government that makes laws, sentence, but Congress wouldn't give him the money to do so. And the note there is that Congress is made up of the Senate and the House of Representatives. Three, White House, the official home of the President of the United States in Washington, D.C. Sentence, that Adams lived in the White House for only four months before Thomas Jefferson became the next president. Note, U.S. President's Office 2. Presidency, the office, length of service, and jobs of a president. Sentence, it was no wonder James Buchanan was happy when his presidency was over. So that note there is really letting us know about his time in office. Five, history. Everything that has happened in the past to people or things or a telling of these events. The sentence, some didn't live there long. Some are names rarely mentioned except in history books. And then I note there is that history is past or a long time ago, not the present. And lastly, country, a large area of land where people live under the same government or have the same culture or nation. The sentence was the country was heading toward the Civil War. And the note there is that the country we live in is the United States. We hope that you have these answers, but if you have something a little different with your sentence or with your notes, that's fine, but your definition should basically be the same. All right, so now it's time for your homework. This week for your homework, we're using a choice board because we're going to be talking about content area vocabulary. So the choice board says, choose an activity below. Write your responses on another piece of paper. Color over the task after you have completed it. So for prepare, we have prepare a set of six questions, include vocabulary words in each question, then write answers to the questions with additional vocabulary words. All right, the next one I have is hunt. Go on a word hunt. 
Look at textbooks, fiction books, or nonfiction books for six of your vocabulary words. Once you find each word, rewrite the sentence word for word. Then we have to write. Write a diary entry from the perspective of a giant elf or unicorn. Include all of your vocabulary words in the diary entry. Next is doodle. Doodle each vocabulary word. Write the words in a doodly way. Be sure to add doodles to help show the word's meaning. Then we have create. Create a set of flashcards for your vocabulary words. You might add pictures on your cards to help remember the definitions. And then lastly, make. Make a vo vocabulary test. You might include matching multiple choice and short answer questions on your test. Don't forget an answer key. Be creative, check your work, and make your responses fun and imaginative. All right, guys, we are back. Sad to say this is the end of our lesson, but we will see you on Thursday with what we always do. So what do we do on Thursday? We're doing passages on Thursday to help prep with some continual content vocabulary and more information about presidents. Okay, see you then. Bye.